What's up everybody? It's Greg Peters with the Car Passion Channel here, and I've decided that even though I just broke a personal record for how much horsepower the red car is making, which if you haven't seen the dyno video, go back and check that out first, I'm shooting for more. See, there are a couple things that held the car back from being able to safely make 500 horsepower on the dyno, and I'll be addressing one of those things in today's video with a complete fuel system upgrade. So, even though the car really doesn't need to be any faster at all, I think it's just time to shoot for 500 just to do it, to say I did it, to get that street cred, that e-fame. So I'm either going to break 500 horsepower or I'm going to break the engine into multiple pieces attempting it. But either way, it's going to be a good time. So let's get started. All right, let's begin with the star of the show here, and that would be this set of Injector Dynamics ID1300 fuel injectors. Just to give you an idea on the flow capabilities of these bad boys, a single fuel injector shown here can flow about the same as five stock fuel injectors. So these things mean business. Now I did consider going to another brand because the IDs are one of the most expensive options, but I've had such a good experience with the ID1000s that are currently in the car that I decided to just ball out and stick with injector dynamics. Those injectors will be paired up with a Walbro or TI Automotive 450 liter per hour fuel pump. Now this thing is capable of flowing above 550 wheel horsepower on E85 and that's more power than the turbocharger is actually capable of making so this thing will have plenty of flow for my application. I'm upsizing from a 340 liter per hour pump which started to run out of fuel pressure right around 450 horsepower and I will finally be providing my fuel pump with a dedicated power source and relay. A common problem with going through the stock wiring harness is you will see a pretty significant voltage drop by the time that power reaches your fuel pump, which means you're not reaching the full potential of that pump. And then especially when you go to a pump that can flow a lot more, it draws a lot more amperage and it puts a bigger demand on the stock wiring harness and fuel relay. So it's best to give it a direct power source. And I'm going to show you how to do all of that right now. So a quick recap of the last couple of videos. I dyno tuned the car on the new slightly larger turbocharger. That would be the EFR 67. 758. It made 497 wheel horsepower, but it was leaning out in the high RPM, showing the weakness of the fuel system in the car. In the video after the dyno, I took the car out, I turned the boost down, so the car was making about 440 wheel horsepower, and I had a loss of fuel pressure. Now initially, I thought it might have been a problem with the fuel pressure regulator, but now thinking about it, I think what probably happened is, because we turned the fuel pressure up so high on the dyno, almost 100 PSI, it probably blew that little hose that's between the fuel pump and the fuel pump carrier inside the tank. I'm gonna find that out in just a second. You can see here when I fire the car up, the fuel pressure should be about 60 PSI and it is clearly not that. I'm going to start by replacing the fuel pump, and the first step here is to disconnect the negative battery terminal. Do not skip this step. You're about to have an open fuel system. You have to disconnect your battery. Now that your battery is disconnected, you can pull out the carpet from your parcel shelf and remove this access panel by taking out the Phillips head screws. Before you remove any hoses, you want to let the fuel pressure out of the system. You can do that either by unplugging the fuel pump or the fuel pump relay, cranking the car over for a few seconds, and then disconnecting your battery again before you proceed. I forgot to show that here because my fuel system has no pressure in it. That's the problem. Otherwise, when you do go to remove these hoses, you are going to get quite a spray of fuel and you do not want that. Now, although I can get my favorite hose removal pliers in here to easily get these hoses off, the ones underneath the parcel shelf are quite a bit more difficult. So if your hoses are old like mine, you'll probably need to cut them off with a razor blade. Once the hoses are off, you can loosen all the Phillips head screws that hold the pump assembly into the tank, and then you can just pull it right out. It's also a good idea to throw a rag or something over that opening to make sure that nothing falls into your fuel tank. And as suspected, there is the hose that comes off the fuel pump, and that is exactly where all of my fuel pressure was going. This is also a great time to expose myself for the sketchiest fuel pump install ever. If 
But hey, this was seven years ago, okay? I wasn't quite as good as I am. Well, okay, I guess I pretty much do things the same way now. But anyways, can we just take a second to appreciate these zip ties that have been sitting submerged in E85 for seven years? This is one of those things I told myself I would come back in and redo better and just never did. But neither here nor there. Let's get these things unbuckled and get on with the rest of the install. A couple side notes here. I know there are some pumps that utilize the factory mounting system. This is not one of them. So I will have to get a bit creative with this one as well. And the second thing is the hard line that actually feeds up and out of the tank. I know at least on my car, which is a 1.6 liter NA, I had to cut off a part of that assembly to be able to use a normal rubber hose. So when you guys pull your assembly out and it looks different from mine, that is why. To get the new pump installed, the first thing I'll do is crimp the Walbro harness into the factory plug. I use these butt connectors that have this heat shrink wrap, which has adhesive inside of it. So it creates like a totally waterproof seal when you heat shrink it down. And I'll link these as well as some other useful things from this video down in the description below. Definitely double check for your year, but I know on my car, the blue wire is power, the black wire is ground. And then on the Walbro side, the red wire is power, the black wire is ground. The last thing we want is to get this whole install done and find out that the fuel pump is spinning backwards. Next, to put the fuel sock onto the pump. It just presses onto the bottom there. And then this assembly is ready for install. Slide your new fuel hose onto that hard line and get ready for the most legit upgrade of the entire day. That's right, we're going from zip ties to hose clamps. Listen, if you know of a better way to secure an aftermarket fuel pump into a Miata assembly that does not have the provisions for factory mounting, I'm all ears. But I do know that if zip ties can hold up for as long as they did, hose clamps definitely will also. I like to throw a double clamp on the upper part of this hose since the hard line underneath has no barb. So get those tightened down nice and snug. Don't forget to plug the fuel pump in. And this thing is ready to drop back into the tank. Now it's time to hardwire in the fuel pump. Now there are two different ways to do this. I'm going to be doing it the easy way that does not involve going under the dash at all. There is a way to do this mod that's arguably slightly more proper and you can see how to do that over on the Beavis Motorsport YouTube channel. I'll link that video down below in the description. If you're replacing your fuel system, I recommend you check that video out as well. First step is to run the power and ground cables back to the battery. I forgot to mention earlier that I'm using a Deech works fuel pump hardwire kit. And the one I'm using here is actually an extra heavy duty one that's complete overkill for my application, but I was able to get this one shipped a little bit faster, so I went with it. I'll link both this kit and the one below it down in the description. I'll be running the power and ground all the way to the battery at the back of the car. Now the power wire on this kit was way too long because it's actually designed for adult sized cars as well. So I decided to shorten it. If you do this, make sure you leave the inline fuse in place and you don't get rid of it by accident. That's a pretty important important part of the system. With the power and ground hooked up in the battery area, of course with your battery still disconnected, it's time to tap the rest of the kit into the factory harness. So pull out that fuel pump harness and unwrap it to expose four wires that lead to the plug. There's going to be two wires next to each other that are a little bit thinner. On my car they are yellow and black. Those are the fuel level sender wires. You don't want to mess with those, but the power and ground for the pump are the ones you're going to chop. Now these kits do come with instructions, so be sure to reference those as well in case there are any color discrepancies but in a nutshell you have four wires going to the new relay the red is the power wire coming from the battery the black is the ground the yellow is going to be power going to the pump and the blue is the signal into the relay to switch it on. And that's where today's big shortcut comes into play. So you have this blue power wire that ducks down behind the waterfall panel. That actually goes up to the stock fuel pump relay. And in today's install, I will be leaving the factory fuel pump relay in place. And you might be thinking to yourself, isn't that the point of this whole mod is to get rid of the factory fuel pump relay? Yes and no. So the point of this mod is number one, to get power directly from the battery to the fuel pump. And number two, not have the massive amperage draw of this huge pump going through the factory relay. And in this configuration, even though the signal to turn on the pump is still going through the factory relay, so technically there's another failure point, the amperage of this pump is not going through it. It's going through the bigger, beefier relay. And the benefit of doing it this way is you don't have to go underneath your dash and unravel harnesses and mess with all of that. It's basically a massive pain. 
line. The thick black wire coming from the new relay is the ground for the pump, so that hooks up to the harness going to the pump's plug, and then the ground wire that goes to the factory fuel pump relay, you can just cap it, that will not be hooked up to anything. So the thick yellow wire needs to be connected to the blue wire going to the factory plug, again that is going to be the power going to the pump, and then the thinner blue wire coming out of the relay needs to be hooked up to the trigger that is again going up to the factory fuel pump relay. I will link those wiring diagrams that I just posted on screen down below in the description, but just keep in mind that the colors might not all match up depending on the hardware kit you get and the year of your car. Now you'll notice the wires coming out of this hardware kit are some thick boys. They are actually 10 gauge and the factory wires in the car are probably 18 or 20 gauge. So in order to get a good connection, I just stripped extra insulation off of the factory wire, folded it over itself to make it twice as thick. And then I just used the 10 gauge butt connector to put those two wires together. That's another part of the install that technically could be done a little bit more legit by drilling out the factory fuel pump assembly and installing these post terminals. That way you can run the thicker wiring basically all the way to the pump. And you can see how to do that in the Beavis Motorsport video if you care to do it that way. I'm not really that concerned with it because number one, the wires coming out of the Walbro pump are probably only a 16 gauge wire. And you have to remember that the resistance of a wire is affected by how long it is. And we're only talking about a very short span of this this thinner wire rather than something that runs the entire length of the car the way that it is in the factory configuration. Once everything's all wired in you just need a place to mount your new relay and it's easy enough to just use a self-tapping screw into some sheet metal somewhere. Just make sure you're not accidentally drilling into a fuel line or your fuel tank. Now that the pump is all wired up I just threw on a couple new fuel lines with new clamps and it's time to put the interior of the car back together. The hard stuff is basically all done at this point. Now we just have to do the fuel injectors. Now I'm a bit lucky here with how easy the fuel injectors are to remove from my motor with the Skunk 2 manifold. All I have to do is disconnect the feed and return fuel hoses, unbolt the fuel rail, unplug the fuel injectors, and the whole assembly comes right out. Now I just have to wiggle the 1000cc injectors out of the rail and install the new ID 1300s. Now let's take a quick side by side look here. You'll notice there is a slight difference in that the hat of the 1300 is quite a bit taller. These are the new style injector dynamics injectors and it's not really that big of a deal unless you have an NB engine and a Skunk 2 intake manifold, which I'll show you the problem you run into in just a second once I get these injectors swapped out. When you install fuel injectors into a fuel rail, you want to use some kind of lubrication. I used Vaseline here. Otherwise Otherwise, you run the risk of pinching an injector seal, which will result in a fuel leak that you do not want, especially considering this fuel system is going to be operating at above 90 psi in boost. Installing the injectors into the rail is as simple as just pushing them in. So regardless of what your, your engine is, you do have to run the new style ID injectors sideways like this with the plug facing either forwards or backwards. But the problem is the Skunk 2 manifold is designed to fit both the 94-97 to 1.8 and the 99 plus. 1.8 and it's got a dual bolt pattern on the flange and when you have it on the 99 plus seen here you have this extra aluminum that hangs extra high and gets in the way of you being able to plug in your injectors so you really have two options here number one is to shave down the tabs on the intake manifold now the best way to do this would be to remove the manifold and that's a total pain so I didn't want to do that I was gonna to try to shave these down with everything in place the only thing you have to make sure of is that you do block off the injector holes very well well, otherwise you're gonna get a bunch of aluminum powder inside the motor and you don't really want that. The other option that I found much easier is to just modify the injector plugs so they're not as bulky. Now the EV14 injector plugs have this protective cage around it. It has nothing to do with the waterproofing of the connector. It's just like a ruggedness durability thing and I do not think there's any effect with cutting a part of that cage off and that's exactly what I did. The connectors still click into place. They still have that locking lever. The only difference is they're smaller and they fit. All right, the entire fuel system is installed. It's time to configure a couple things and fire this beast up, hopefully. First, all I want to do is give the fuel system a prime, make sure the pump is actually working, and see if it's obnoxiously loud. Hey! That might actually be quieter than the 5 Motorsports 340 liter per hour pump that I took out of it, which is pretty crazy. I thought this pump was definitely going to be louder, but uh, yeah, it's pretty quiet. The next thing I want to do is reset the base fuel pressure back down to about 60. 
on the dyno in an effort to break 500 horsepower we just cranked the fuel pressure regulator and just basically let it go as high as it could so i want to get that back down and the first step is to get tuner studio connected come up here to can bus test modes and should be under test mode enable test mode we can just turn the fuel pump on well i guess the new pumps definitely got some uh power because it just blew a fuel line somewhere just from priming <laughs> oh my god if it's not one thing it's another i have no idea how high the pressure was but and there you go i don't know where where it happened but something definitely happened to that line but that's okay because actually what i'm wanting to do anyways is run a line from the hard line up there directly to this hard line right here. Uh, yes, that's right, fuel filter delete because I did upgrade to this E85 compatible fuel lab inline fuel filter. I never had a problem with the old stock fuel filter, uh, but I don't know, I just feel like this is a better option. But yeah, anyways, I just gotta throw a quick line down there at the back of the car and we'll be ready to roll. What you know about that fuel filter delete mod? for maximum performance and weight reduction. So yeah, I've never seen anyone do it this way before, but what I will say is the fuel filter, at the very least, will be easier to replace, and I've eliminated a couple extra connections or failure points underneath the car, which is a pain in the butt to get to. So do I recommend doing this? Uh, not necessarily. Like I said, I've never seen anyone do it this way before, but I think it'll be fine. All right, now what I can finally get to is we're gonna turn the fuel pump on. So now with the fuel pump running full blast, I can bring this base pressure back up. And this is gonna be the base pressure at 100 kPa. If you set this with the engine idling, your base pressure will actually be higher because the pressure should lower slightly at idle, I think. I don't know, I'll check it in a second. But setting the base pressure at 60-ish. I'm just gonna lock this down. And then this is a rising rate regulator. So for every PSI of boost, this will raise one PSI fuel pressure. And that makes it so the fuel pressure inside the injectors equally combats the air pressure inside the intake manifold. And the last thing I have to do here before I start it is change my required fuel for the bigger injectors. So just gotta do 3.2 divided by the new injector size, 1300 times the old injector size, which is a thousand and the new required fuel should be we'll just set it at 2.5 and that should be it the car should fire up now <laughs> knock on wood with my luck well i'm not even going to say it let's just turn the key huh wow fire right up oh dang it i jinxed it now nah, this car does that all the time i have no idea what it is Ignore that belt squeak. I'll uh, fix that in post. Look at that. Beautiful. Let me turn my wideband on here and we'll see where we're reading. Heat, that's what I'm gonna bring against them Mustangs, boys. Okay, we're super rich. So that's totally normal. The required fuel value is just an estimate for the new injectors. It's still in warm-up enrichment. There's, oh, see, it's, it's fixing itself already. So yeah. Anytime you change injectors, it's more than just changing the required fuel. There's definitely gonna be some remapping involved. I'll get all that sorted. All that matters right now is this baby is running and it's ready for 500 horsepower. Who is ready? Let's go! So the fuel system is completely installed. It's not tuned yet. And I still need to make a couple minor tweaks to the car before I bring it back to the dyno, mainly just making sure the boost control is really in check and under control. 
Uh, I found a couple small things in the data logs that I didn't really discover at first, but I'll get into that in the next video. No need to lengthen this thing up anymore. The Dino Tune is coming very soon. I will be going back for my three wheel horsepower and it seems small, but gosh dang it, I want a piece of paper printed out from that dyno that says the engine that I built in my garage made 500 horsepower. Anyways, if you did enjoy this video, if you did learn something, don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe if you are new, and I will catch you in the next one. Peace out.